Um, well, first thing like you do is actually turn on your mobile phone. So um, if you've got uh, particularly a smartphone, uh, an iOS phone, an Apple phone, or an Android phone, I'd like you to actually interact a bit today. Um, so you can see on the screen there's a QR code. So if you've got a camera phone, you should be able to decode that using a QR code scanner. So if you've got an Android phone, you can search on the Google Play, which used to be your Android market, download a QR code scanner for free. If you've got an iPhone, you can look on the iTunes store and download uh, a QR code scanner for free as well. Um, if you scan that, hopefully it's clear enough. Sometimes the projectors don't give it sharp enough resolution. But what it will do is take you to this wiki page, which I've got an outline of the presentation. So you'll be able to actually follow along on your mobile device. And if there's something really interesting for you, you could click on some of the links. So has anyone managed to scan that, decode it? Does it work for people? Yep, cool. So you've arrived at this wiki page. The second thing I'd like you to interact with today is it was using Twitter. So you can see on the uh, left-hand screen here, this is an uh, animation of Twitter on visible tweets. And we're using a hashtag Moppet12 because uh, so Targo Poly that's uh, organized the workshop. So we're just going to use the same hashtag for this presentation. So if you use Twitter, uh, and you find something interesting today and you'd like to remember that or you'd like to interact some way, uh, you know, maybe ask a question via Twitter, then use that hashtag in the tweet and we'll come up on the screen and uh, we'll have a, have a look as it comes through. So you've seen the tweets from the workshops for the last day and a half that we've been running. So the M is for mobile, OPIT is for Otago Poly and 12 for 2012. So please tweet and uh, take some photos, some video, and, and it'd be great to see that stuff there. And uh, if we get time, I'll show you a tool that we've been starting to use in teaching where we start curating social media. Um, but you need to have some media to curate, so we'd like to have some tweets there, some photos, some video that we could use at the end of the session. Right, so I guess the first thing is, um, why mobile learning? So can anyone tell me what this is? You're very quiet. It's a QR code, but I want to know what it's um, linking to. It means you have to scan it. Yes? This is connecting to uh, a URL. Um, what I want you to do is scan it and tell me what it is. It's an umbrella, so someone's found it. It's actually a picture, okay? So let me just open this up. There it is. It's a picture I took in Berlin uh, about a month ago, and um, I've just um, uploaded that to Picasa, to Google's photo sharing site. Um, and we talk about mobile devices. Well, mobile devices are pretty much everywhere these days, and this is a mobile device I saw in Berlin. Um, this is a Bratwurst grill. So this person has to stand there all day selling uh, hot dogs, basically, to people, and they've got a, this grill strapped to them. So they've got this hot grill, they've got a rubbish tin on the back, they've got an umbrella at the top, and uh, they're standing there walking around selling hot dogs. Uh, and what they're doing is undercutting the stalls. So the stalls are selling them for one euro ninety, and uh, this mobile um, set up here is selling them for one euro uh, and twenty. So they're saving about um, seventy cents in euros by buying it from the mobile store. Um, so, you know, mobile devices are everywhere. These are not the type of mobile devices that I'm really interested in, although I actually like sausages, so I thought it was pretty cool. Um, what we're looking at is really smartphones, because basically almost everyone owns ones these days. Everyone's got a phone. Everyone's got a, a phone. Everyone's, probably a lot of people have got two phones, and increasingly, the phone that people have is a smartphone. It's uh, Android or iOS, Windows Mobile, Symbian. Uh, it's got an operating system. It's basically a multimedia computer with a whole range of sensors built into it. And what I'm interested in is how can we use these devices in a unique way to change teaching and learning? So what I'm not interested in is podcasting a lecture or videoing a lecture and sending it to a mobile screen, which is really, really small and really, really hard to look at. It's kind of like, well, I haven't changed anything. I'm still delivering a lecture, um, and all I'm doing is make it really hard for people to view. Apart from the fact that they could watch it anywhere, 
uh, I haven't changed anything in teaching and learning. So what I'm interested in, how can I change teaching and learning using these devices as a catalyst? Uh, and here's just a nice short little video showing you the impact of mobile um, is having in, in the world, really. Actually, just, just um, go and show the offline version. I've downloaded this already. Just because I'm not sure how it's going to stream, so let's have a quick look. We have 2 minutes and 51 seconds to explain that 2010 was the year that mobile connected the world. Consider. 2009, 300 million apps downloaded. 2010, 5 billion apps downloaded. If the world population grew at the same rate, it would jump from 7 billion people in 2009 to 112 billion people in a single year. But that's not real. This is the mobile year in review 2010. In 2010, location-based services dominated. 2009, 200,000 Foursquare users. 2010, 5 million users. And one check-in from an astronaut in space. In 2010, social media continued to move to mobile. 347% growth in Twitter mobile usage. 200 million mobile Facebook users. 100 million YouTube videos played on mobile devices every day. In 2010, Half of all page views were to social network sites. Growth in one company's data traffic since 2008, 3,000%. Cell phones and desktop internet came to 1 billion people and devices with projected 40 times growth by 2015. The digital camera died in 2010. February 2010, iPhone becomes most popular camera on Flickr. 2010, 76% of adults use their phone to take pictures. That includes you and mom, by the way. In 2010, we learned that these app things aren't just online games. In 2010, there was an app for just about everything. While those apps are great, the kids still love the text. 3,339 mind-blowing average number of texts sent per month by US teens. For mobile carriers, 2010 was competitive enough to make Donald blush. 96% of mobile users can choose from three or more providers. 92% are satisfied with their providers. Lowest grade per minute of 22 developed nations. Record 77 million smartphones shipped in the fall of 2010 alone. Plus, there's always this. 2009, 3G mobile internet on Mount Everest? No. 2010, 3G mobile internet on Mount Everest? No. But let's talk about the monies. Jobs created by mobile industry, 2.4 million. Money invested by wireless providers in one year, 20.4 billion. Fun fact if you like good news and money. Average wireless industry job paid 50% above the national average. To review, 2010 meant more usage, more data, more handsets, more apps, more developers, more competition, more mobile. Okay, so I didn't create that video, but it uh, gives you a good overview of some of the rate of change uh, with mobile devices, and that was 2010. So they've updated that movie for 2011. Um, I just thought the 2010 one was a bit more fun, so that's the one I showed you. So in, in, in between that, it's another two years. And uh, the, the growth of, of mobile and social media, the marriage of the two, is, is just really ballooning uh, beyond anyone's expectations. So what I've been looking at is how we can use mobile social media in teaching and learning. So in other words, use free stuff and reappropriate it for teaching and learning because everyone's got a mobile device and the social media is free and, and it's all about collaboration, about communication, about connecting, which are some of the core things we want our graduates to be able to do when they leave. We want them to be able to work in teams. We want them to be able to learn how to communicate, how to collaborate, how to share, become part of a global community. They don't do that inside the LMS. You know, that keeps them, make sure that they pay their fees. And uh, Jan Harrington's got a very nice article which talks about digital myopia. Uh, which is you know, pretty much what happens when we get stuck inside the learning management system, is you get this very narrow view of the world. Of course, you don't have to, but it's just the way it ends up quite often. So we're trying to look beyond that, um, so we're not really looking at stuff that's going into a university-managed site, but into stuff that's freely available outside. Um, so we're almost having this new hierarchy of needs 
I don't know if you've come across Maslow before, but uh, this ended up on a blog post that I saw, which is quite good, and I've just copied it down. The link to the original blog post is further up. So today, particularly for younger people, the highest uh, need seems to be uh, the connection to the mobile device. You try and take away a phone from a teenager and see what happens. I don't know if anyone's tried that. You know, try and ground your teenager. Uh, you'd have a real war on, on your hands. So this device is important to, to you know, school leavers and people coming into the classroom. What do we do? We tell them to turn it off. What do you think that's doing to them in their concept of the teaching learning space? Straight away, we're alienating them. You know? What can we do to actually engage them with this technology? That's the key. What can we do to engage them? Some, some other um, use of a mobile and social media and, and just general society. Um, some really interesting ones here. Uh, this is from the Christchurch quake. I don't know if you saw this on the news. This was in the news um, where the cathedral uh, obviously collapsed and uh, they weren't going to send uh, people in there in case it collapsed some more and wanted to see if anyone was trapped in there. So what they did was went down to Dick Smith, bought uh, a flying uh, toy helicopter and there's an app you can download for your iPhone and your iPad to navigate that and it's got two webcams on it, one that faces forward, one that faces down and they use that to actually scout out uh, these buildings and there's a video online of them flying this into uh, the building using the webcam to check it out and then flying it out again. I think eventually they did crash it but uh, it wasn't a huge expense, it was only 500 bucks or something from Dick Smith. So there's one example. Uh, you can look at the video yourself. There's a link there to the video if you like. Um, another example from Christchurch. I thought this just might be, you know, contextually relevant. There's an app that's been developed by HitLab in Christchurch. Uh, they call it City View AR. And what they've done there is you can virtually see what buildings used to look like. You can go around with your Android phone using the camera and overlay the real world with digital information and see what the buildings looked like before they fell down. So people still get an experience of what the city used to look like. And so they've developed this app, they've put models in there, they've taken you know, photographs that people had beforehand and overlaid them and uh, people can, can have this whole experience of the CBD before the quake. And this is freely available so uh, you can download the app uh, for an Android phone. They've also made this available for an augmented reality browser called Genio. And Genio is available for a whole host of platforms, for Symbian, for Android, for iOS devices. You can scan that. That'll take you to download Genio. Then you can search for that layer and download that layer. Has anyone tried that? Anyone you worked with augmented reality browsers? You're all looking very like no. One person, okay. Um, well, let's just have a quick um, demo of an augmented reality browser because I think it's quite cool. So I'm just going to come back here and uh, I'm just going to wirelessly connect my iPhone so you can see. Uh, here it is coming up. So this is my iPhone screen just live and you can see these are my notes actually um, for this workshop. Um, and you can see exactly what I've got on my screen. So I'm just wirelessly mirroring, in this case, to my laptop, but I could do this to an Apple TV connected to a big screen TV or to a projector. Um, but let's have a look at Wikitude. So I've got Wikitude open already. Wikitude is an augmented reality browser. Here's some points of interest that people have tagged, uh, created, some default ones here. It's contextual, so it finds positional information that's been tagged that's close to where I am. So it's using the GPS and the compass built into the iPhone. Now, because I'm inside a concrete bunker, it's not going to give me a very good location. If I was outside, I'd get a better position. But it's saying there's, there's three pubs that are close to my location at the moment if I wanted to go and get a drink. Um, I've also created some layers myself, so I prefer coffee. So I've created a layer called Great Dunedin Cafes. So if you've got your, your um, 
smartphone there, you could actually download Wikitude, it's a free app from the iTunes store, Android Market, Symbian, and you could search for my layer that I've created, and, and if I just open that layer up, you can see there's three cafes I've created. Modex, who's been to Modex? Yeah, someone told me they had the best coffee, so I went to check it out, and uh, I took a photo, and upload that to Picasso, and because this is all linked on to that layer which you can actually download to your phone, you can see my photo. I'm just showing it to you here, but you can actually download it to your phone. And I can just zoom in there, and we can see what's on the hotties list there, which is a, a long black for $3.50. It's not bad, it's, you know, $4 in Auckland. And um, it was quite a nice environment, and quite like the coffee, so that was, that was good, that was a good tip. Of course, it's not just all about um, things like coffee. You can use this as a tool for a whole variety of things. So another thing that I've used it for is perhaps a slightly more interactive way of showing my um, research output. Um, so because this is contextual, it's just showing one point. So this is the layer I've created. There's actually 32 points on there of various selected conference proceedings around the world. But because I'm in Dunedin, it's just showing me the point that's in Dunedin, which is the workshops I've been running. So I can click on there and I've got a link to the flyer so I, people could download the flyer and they could view and see that I've done this presentation here. Um, you can also look at that on a map. So there it is on Google Maps showing me my position right now, which is down the road a bit. It's not too bad, actually. And you can see I've tagged the Polytech, which is where the workshops are running. If I wanted to actually do that in real time, live view, I can turn on the camera. And then it gives me, uh, using the GPS and the compass, tells me that that point of interest I've tagged is over that way. And if I click on it, give me the info. If I don't know how to get there, I could load that up on Google Maps and give me walking information to get there. So suddenly you've got this really interactive multimedia experience. And it's like, well, how could you use that in teaching and learning? What, what are some of the things that your students could create and share? You know, what are some of the information that's geopositional that would be re relevant to, to their audience or potentially to an employer? You know, as part of their CV. So that's, that's one mobile technology that I think has is, is got huge potential using augmented reality. And it's actually really easy to create. You don't even need to know code to create those layers. You just go to a website, it's a web form. Fill it in, and away you go. Okay, I'm just going to save my battery, so I'm just going to turn that screen mirroring off for a sec. So hopefully people are doing some tweets, but um, the other thing I'd like you to do is actually take part in this poll. So I've got a, a uh, poll here, and uh, let's just bring that up. We've been doing this poll in the workshops. I've just got a bigger on this screen so you can see the, the number to send the poll to, and what I'd like you to do is vote. Now there's three ways to vote on this poll, okay? You can send a text message. So you can see the text message is actually an Australian number, plus 61, that's why it's a plus, 61 for Australia. It's going to cost you 20 cents. But um, if, you're, if, if you're too cheap to send a text message, you can use Twitter. So if you've got a Twitter account on your phone, on your laptop, whatever, you can send the code to my Twitter address that will come up on the poll. Or if you've just got a laptop with you and you don't have Twitter, you can just go to the website here and vote on the website. So what I'm asking to vote on is what type of phone you have, what type of mobile device you've got. And you can see the codes on the right-hand side, well, left-hand side for you. If you've got a basic phone, the code to text is uh, 503391. And you send that to plus 61429883481, and it will come up on the screen. Um, if you've got an iPhone, you'd send 503393 and your choice of text message, Twitter, or web. And that will update on, on our screen here. So you can see there's a couple coming through now. The interesting thing with this poll is it's actually relatively different to the polls I've done in Auckland, uh, where there's actually been very few plain old vanilla te um, cell phones, normally around sort of the 10 to 12 percent. Um, and there's been a lot more Android phones. So the polls I've been doing, uh, there has been, the majority has actually been iPhones, generally in the sort of uh, um, 50 to 60 percent range. Generally the Android has been around about 40 percent, and then sort of 10 percent of plain phones and 
just about nothing else. So the mix of people that we've got here is a little bit different. And the interesting thing to, to, to do is to uh, see if there's a difference between what you own as lecturers, what the mobile technology you have as lecturers, and what your students do. You know, do a poll like this with your students. And don't make assumptions, we've done that. We've made assumptions about different groups of students and saying, you know, they don't have this technology or they have this. And then we've actually asked them and it's completely different. So you need to actually ask them to find out. So I'll leave that poll running and uh, we'll probably come back to it a little bit later. So um, there's a whole range of ways that you can use mobile devices and I use them in a lot of pr um, productivity ways as well. So for me, um, we've just moved to Pukekohe, uh, which is sort of an hour out of Auckland, and it takes me an hour and a half to get to work every day. An hour of 10 minutes of that is on the train. Using my mobile device, I can actually do some work on the train, be connected and, and do stuff. And so for me, it's a great productivity tool. So things like, here's my uh, outline from a workshop, I can be updating that on the train. And then that's synchronised to my online um, Evernote. And then when I get to work, I can open that up on my laptop and keep on editing it. I've got Twitter, so I can interact with people. Here's a tweet that uh, one of the lecturers in Auckland sent me just as we were starting, asking about um, a meeting that we've got tomorrow. I haven't had time to reply yet, but um, it is still on. Um, see, some of the other tools that I use... Uh, for reading news, I use um, Flipboard. Does anyone use Flipboard? It's great on the iPad. It's you know a bit bigger, but it's also an iPhone app here now, and it's a way of curating, aggregating uh, news. So the blogs and news feeds that I that I um, subscribe to. You can see I mainly subscribe to sort of technical ones on uh, what's happening. Um, so here's Engadget, and you can go in and find out more about that article. Internet's just going a little bit slow at the moment. There we go. And read it. And I can be doing that on the train. I can be much more interactive as well. <clears throat> um, one of my favourite tools at the moment is Google+. And uh, we're using Google+, because we've got some international collaborations happening between different countries in the UK, Germany and Spain. And uh, the Google+, Plus app on the iPhone and Android is fantastic allows us to have up to 10 people doing a video chat at once. And because of the time difference between New Zealand and the UK, uh, sometimes the, these, these chat sessions have been when I'm on the train. Um, I haven't, you know, because it's during the time that I'm actually commuting. And so I can actually still connect uh, with these video hangouts and the stream of information that's happening right on my phone. Um, the guy that's the meerkat there, James Clay, he's from the UK. He's a uh, uh, technology uh, educationalist over in the UK, AG Can, he's in the UK as well. So for me, these are tools for having a, a community, a community of like-minded people and filtering that information and finding out ideas from them as well. Um, so these are just some of the tools that I use. And of course, you can read off these devices. The Kindle app's fantastic. Uh, and once again, it synchronizes. So it says, you know, you weren't quite at that point last time, this is the point you're at. And then you can download books, um, synchronise them across your devices, and starting uh, reading Game of Thrones at the moment. You see, there you go. Yeah, question. Sorry, just one question, because Tom, you, you talked about how a recorded lecture on the iPhone is more open from attending a lecture, and that's not what you're interested in. That's right. The Kindle, an e-book and a book, is it the same? Yeah, what I'm showing you here is just some productivity apps that I use personally. This is not particularly teaching learning stuff here. So yep. not, not what I'm showing you right here, no. So we're just warming up to that. Okay, so I wanted to show you just some, what, where people normally start is with productivity. What, and what helps them with their personal workflow. And those are just some of the things that I do. Because if you're going to start using mobile devices, there's got to be a benefit for you. And you need to experience that yourself. So for me, starting that experience with how can I be more productive is one way. And then I start thinking, okay, what can I do that's different? How can I do something with my students? And that's perhaps some, where something like Wikitude would come in a bit more, uh, and getting students to create their own Wikitude layers. So let me just flick out of that for the moment. 
So I've got a few examples to show you of how we're trying to reinvent teaching and learning, and they're coming up in just a moment. So this is uh, a Wikitude layer that, that I've created. I just wanted to really quickly show you, because it's actually so simple to do. You get the sh your students to do this, to create this. So the cool thing is not about um, creating layers for your students, but getting your students to create these layers of information. Then they go, well, this is something I created. You know, like that cafe layer. I shot that photo. You know, so I'm kind of proud of it, because it's, it's a photo I took. You know, it's not a, a photo someone else took and I've just seen online. It's the photo I took, and I've shared that with the world. So some of the layers that I've got here, this is um, the, uh, the layer that has my conference proceedings on here, and I can just log in with my account. So it's just a web form to actually create these. And it's just a little bit simpler to do on a laptop than on the iPad. You still can do this on, the, on a mobile device. It's just slightly more clunky. To view them is, is better on the, on the actual device. So this layer here, you put a certain information. It's just a web form. You put a description of, of what it is. Uh, and then the title is going to be what's searched. Description, so people can actually find out what, what it's about. Put your name as the author or whoever the author is. And you create the, what's called the KML file in Google Maps or Google, Google Earth. So you go and find your points of interest. You geotag them. And you can put more descriptive information about it there. You can put links to online content. Save that KML file. It's just an export option. Then you upload this to Wikitude. And then that becomes searchable content on the Wikitude browser. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can see all the points of interest that you've uploaded by looking on Google Maps. So in the browser, it does a contextual search. There's the stuff that's close. But this is all the contents that's there. So before when I did the Wikitude browser, it just showed you the one that was close to me, which is in Dunedin. But there's actually 32 points on that, that actual map. And uh, by clicking on this, you can see some more information. So this was a conference in Madrid. And um, there's the reference. And I can click on the link, and it's going to take me to the abstract of the paper. Uh, and people can read that if they're interested. So in some ways, what I'm doing there, this is just an idea. Um, this is just a personal thing. So we haven't actually done this, this particular one in teaching. But for me, it's just a cool way of showing something like a bibliography of research outputs that's pretty dry and boring in a slightly more interactive and, and visual way. Yeah. Does it have to be public information? Or can that be no, it doesn't have to be public. But if you're putting it there, it's kind of like, why wouldn't you make it public? Um, but you do get the option in Wikitude to not make it public. It's just then no one except you can see it. So it's kind of a bit pointless. And I guess what we're doing for um, students is that uh, what we're trying to get them to do is engage in a world community. So we're trying to encourage them not to hide stuff away. Because once they do that, what's the point if no one else can see it? If they can't see how good you are, then you know, why would they employ you? So we, we encourage them to be really quite public about their stuff. What we do is put guidelines around it. So for me, it's about trying to bring about change. And um, let me just show you uh, another little video which I think sort of encapsulates some of these concepts. So we're just going to jump out of there and go and find this video. And this was by um, The Guardian newspaper. So we have started doing some proje projects in journalism. And just as we started doing these projects, um, the, the Guardian put out this little overview of how they saw social media in impacting journalism and, and newspapers. Houses. He had asthma. The wolf had asthma. So what's the truth about the pig's houses being blown back? 
and so Joe. There's no reason why those two houses, one made from straw, the other from wood, should have collapsed. Not even a healthy wolf's huff and puff could bring them down. The three little kids have confessed to conspiring to commit insurance fraud, framing the wolf in an attempt to cover their tracks. Their motive was financial, as they struggled to keep up with their mortgage repayments. I'm behind on my payments too. How could this have happened? I've lost my family. So it's a way of sort of trying to advertise that they're on the cutting edge and they're engaging with social media, but also how social media can influence how a story is told uh, from, a, from a journalist sort of perspective. And that was really quite useful for us as an illustration because we're starting to talk to journalism lecturers and what they traditionally do um, would do a, a case study where they talk about how social media has impacted uh, a story. Uh, and they'd hand out pieces of paper that they've, you know, they've photocopied from the, from the newspaper and say, you know, read this about the social media story. They didn't engage with social media. So what they do, they come into the classroom, they tell the students to turn the phones off. So what we're doing now is we, they're actually using Twitter in the classroom, getting students to, to learn how to use the social media technology in an authentic, relevant way. So when they're out there, as a journalist, they've got some guidelines around how to use it rather than just theory about it. Um, so that, that, let me just show you here a little snippet of this. Um, this is a journalism lecturer talking about some of the impact this is having on her teaching. And I just recorded this via SoundCloud and uploaded this. SoundCloud's a great mobile app. Um, I've got one of my colleagues and the last semester or two, colleagues and the another one should be here soon, uh, making up our community of practice. Um, and Danny and I actually started last semester introducing social media um, into the teaching of journalism. Now, journalism as a practice has been at the cutting edge of developing uh, the use of social media through crowdsourcing, finding sources. They, they have, um, journalists across the world have been putting social media to use in, in gathering their stories and in um, Get it, driving um, uh, traffic to their websites. Um, the teaching of journalism, on the other hand, has actually been lagging behind the practice. Um, we always like to think of ourselves in academics as, as being the, the leaders, really, of the practice. Uh, that's just not been the case recently in journalism. And, um, and I actually travelled to the UK and to the US to, to uh, look at what was happening in newsrooms and also in universities and found that it's only in the last semester or two that uh, teaching in the UK at Cardiff and in, in a leading school in the United States have actually been introducing social media teaching. So um, we've been, uh, we're actually um, kind of ahead of the game really at AUT in trying to bring uh, experiential, authentic, use that word again, um, experiences into the classroom. Traditionally, of course, we would teach case study. Here, here's what journalists are doing. Um, we're actually trying to make it that they're doing it within the classroom so that when they get out there, that they're ready for it. And, and, and they're using it socially, students, but they're not necessarily using it professionally. So we tried to sort of reinvent the way that they approach. So rather than having a disconnect between theory and practice, we actually merge the two. So they're actually using these tools in the classroom and using them to teach. And um, we, we just did a little video of Helen, that was Helen speaking there uh, last week, actually using an iPad wirelessly wandering around the classroom and, and presenting. Uh, and that was the first time she'd done that. Uh, and so she's actually trying a whole lot of different ideas on how to engage her students and, and reinvent the, the classroom environment. So uh, just going back to the wiki, we'll just skip over some of the theory behind what we're trying to do because you can read that later and it's the boring stuff. Um, I wanted to show you some more examples of what we're doing and hopefully you know, get you sort of thinking about the potential to have some pedagogical change. So we just started on the the journalism one there, so we've got links to all the stuff on the wiki here, so there's a link to the SoundCloud example. And one of the things that we've been doing as a, as a tool is using Storify. Actually, I'll just bring the Storify app up, because uh, there's a great app for the iPad now for Storify. I don't know if anyone's used Storify. Anyone tried Storify? 
allows you to curate and annotate social media. So this is the Storify app just loading up and it's loading my stories. And one of them is uh, the journalism students actually presenting reports on the use of social media in Auckland. And what they're doing is they're actually presenting these remotely to students in Germany, Spain and the UK. And I streamed this live um, from my iPhone using Quick. So this is the Storify. You can see down the right hand side these are the quick links to the types of social media that you can curate. So there's Twitter, there's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Flickr, and there's a few others as well. So you can do a search on those social media sites for various hashtags or various topics or descriptive words. It comes up, you then start curating and collating that. And this is just basically a curation of the activity around this, this um, social media presentation event. So to start with, you've got the tweets happening, and these are between um, the, the people in different countries, and there's about 12 hours difference. So this was about 11 a.m. in the morning for us. It was about 12, 1 a.m. Uh, in, uh, in the morning for the people in Spain and Germany and the UK. So this is Alona here, and, and um, she's actually in Germany. So we're just actually inviting them into this event to start with, and then she's retweeting that to her students. Um, Ma, who's in Spain, is doing the same, just basically you know, letting her students know this event is going to happen. If they want to watch it live, they can click on the tweet that comes up. Uh, there's Helen from the UK. And so there's quite a bit of um, collaboration going around by the lecturers in the background, and then there's the main event, which is us starting to actually stream it. And so you can see them responding to the fact that they're sending off the link to their students to be able to click on and, and watch this live. And there's a little snapshot I took of me with my really high-tech uh, iPhone stand, a um, bit of gaffer tape, holding it onto a bit of pipe there. And uh, we just streamed these students in Auckland doing their social media presentations live, took various snapshots, and you can see this interaction happening live from across the world, coming into that. So all of that's coming into the classroom. You know? And previously we couldn't do that because the classroom is this isolated physical place that, uh, you know, we... we we don't sort of bridge out of that. And what's happening here is we're bringing that experience and taking it right around the world and getting feedback live, which is quite incredible. So here's just some snapshots of their presentations. And um, then I got a tweet from Germany saying, hey, we'd like to see the um, students presenting, because I was focusing on the screen. So I just you know, swiveled the iPhone and they could see the students presenting, because they wanted to put some sort of you know, human context around these students as well. Now that's really important in virtual community. And then I've got a link to the actual video. You can actually watch the video. It's online, etc. So that's Storify. And what we're doing with Storify is we're reinventing an essay. So their assessment is going to be, instead of writing a 3,000 word essay on a social media case study and how that sort of impacts journalism, it's going to be, co you know, bring together a social media event with the actual social media, the tweets, the videos, the, the photos, all the stuff that impacted all the critical incidents and tell us why, how they linked, what, what the issue was, and how it was informed by those social media events. So it becomes an authentic experience, an authentic creation of the social media rather than just you know, um, something talking about it. So that's, that's one example, and that's what we've been doing in journalism. Um, Another one that we've been doing is uh, an international collaboration, um, really looking at co-creating curricula. And so we've got um, lecturers, once again, in Germany, Spain, and UK. And we put up this wiki page. And this wiki is just co-generated by all the different participants. Uh, and you can see the student um, presentations on one of the pages. So this is from 2011. This is last year. And we've sort of moved this on this year. Um, but these links to all the different team projects that these students created around the world. And then they shared these with each other's group, did peer review, commenting, interacted, and had this really rich experience. And it was also like a cultural exchange. Because things were geotagged, they could click on Google Maps and see where that object came from. So in Berlin, students in Auckland could click on the object tagged in Berlin, see it in its actual context. and actually starts to make some more sense than just reading it in a book. So we've taken that a little bit further this year. And um, 
what we're doing this year is, uh, let's just get back to that. Oops, clicked on the wrong one. Um, we're actually using WordPress blog this year. So let's just go to WordPress blog. And uh, this is a site where it's really just as a home page for the, uh, the lecturers, but we're bringing the students' stuff into here as well. Um, so the blog just gives you a, a bit of a, a timeline of some of the critical events that are happening. So this is the, this year's social media report from Berlin, and they've got links to various um, student presentations. So these are the different student groups. There's a group that's done Faces of Social Media in Berlin. There's a group that's done church online, and they're looking at, a, at how a church in Berlin actually uses social media and has this virtual church congregation and you know, the impact of that. Um, Location-based services in Berlin, political parties, social media in Berlin, et cetera, et cetera. And this is really interesting for students who don't live in, live in Berlin, try to get some context around this cultural group, which is completely different to us. You know? Here's the update from the UK uh, and their blogs. Uh, Here's uh, some screen grabs from the lecturers doing a Google Plus Hangout. And it's not all just serious stuff. Some of this is fun as well. So I don't know if you've used Google Plus, but um, Google quite ha like having a bit of fun. And so you can actually do overlays. And uh, here's some of the overlays. Let's just make this a little bit bigger so you can see. So you can have these virtual hats uh, on the participants. And it's just a few of the screenshots. You can see some of the lecturers there. Uh, and there's chat going on behind that as well. But every now and then they do something crazy just to make it liven up a bit. Particularly, you know, when it's one o'clock in the morning, you want something to keep you awake. Mm -hmm. so question. Yeah. Sorry, just what's the, um, in order to facilitate this in the classroom, what's the minimum technology that's required in the classroom to actually facilitate this? Um, well, I think the minimum technology, you really, you start with what do your students own. So find out what your students own. And then you go from there. I think you will find that the highest majority of your students have at least a camera phone, and the biggest majority will have a smartphone. But in order to get it, like in this area here, in order to stream it, do you want to see people interacting with it in the classroom? So yeah, it? smartphone. Yeah. yeah. So you need a, need a reasonably um, decent smartphone to do this sort of thing. An Android or, or an iOS phone, Windows Mobile, no one's buying those yet, um, or a high end Symbian. Because you obviously use an Apple TV, that sort of stuff, to get it up onto the screen? Yep. And what you can do is you can share that. So you, um, you can put a password on your Apple TV or on, on the app that I've got on the laptop here, and you can say to your students, hey, Fred, show us what you've been up to. They don't have to come at the front, log on, and stuff around. They can just switch to it on their iPhone and, and present it from where they are. Um, the Android device, there's an app called Double Twist with Air Twist. You can download, and they can stream media. They can't mirror the screen. They can show slideshows. They can show video. Um, but the full mirroring is part of Apple protocol. So obviously, Apple wants you to buy their product. So. Yeah, not, obviously the students don't have no, but they can stream content. So they can stream media from Android what devices. Okay, cool. Double, twist, Double twist. And you buy an add-on for it called Air Twist, which enab enables the media streaming. OK, um, so let's have another look at example. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, let's have a look at Prezi here. So Prezi is a sort of alternative presentation tool, uh, and I quite like it, mainly because it has a really good um, presentation tool for the iPad, and it's web-based, so I can just give people the link so they can see it. So this is a Prezi about their, one of our collaborative projects and I'll just quickly show you this just to give you a little bit of context to it. So um, this is, goes alongside the WordPress blog that we've been talking about. So there's myself and my role in this group. I don't teach students direct, directly. My students are lecturers. So I work alongside the lecturers and in this group I'm effectively a technology steward helping them make hopefully good choices about what technology to use. This is Alona who's the lecturer in Berlin and she teaches sociology students. Uh, this is Helen. She talk, teaches acoustic students in um, Salford University, and so they're interested in, in mobile media. 
this is Ma, who's in Tarragona in Spain, and she teaches Master of Education students. And this is Avril, so you saw the screenshot of Avril before. She's teaching um, public relations within journalism at AUT. So that's, that's the team of uh, the iColab team, I suppose. Um, but some of the projects that we've done, and, and the, the links to these prezies are all on the wiki there if you want to have a look. I guess, you know, the ubiquity of mobile devices is, is really a bit of a no-brainer when you come to stats. Pretty much the most ubiquitous technology is television at the moment. So just about everyone has access to technology. And this is by, from these stats from 2010, is by family. So it's by household group rather than each individual person. These are household groups that have access. And you can see that mobile subscriptions are pretty close. So worldwide, at the end of 2010, about 76% of people had access to mobile. And that's across the whole world. In some countries, like the US, it's over 100%, because everyone has more than one phone. In Africa and India, there's still about 70% 70, 70 uh, uh, you know, people have a mobile device. So it's the device that people have. The, 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 if we're using stuff that's internet-based on computers, well, we're really limiting our audience. So you're talking before about the access. Well, only 800 million people in the world have computers. Uh, and this is why Google and Apple and uh, you know, all the big players uh, in, in computing and the internet are targeting mobile because that's the market. That's the growing market. People in India and Africa, their first port of call to the internet is on their phone. That's where they're getting their connection to the internet. And for me, it's about how can we use this as a catalyst for change. So I quite like this quote from Agnes about changing teaching and learning using mobile. And we quite like um, using a concept called hootagogy, which is about student-directed, student-negotiated learning. So um, you can go in and have a, have a look at that presentation a little bit later if you want to find the rest of it. There's a few more examples there. We've got some projects we're doing with mobile film, so film students that are investigating how to use mobile film and collaborating around the world, so they're co-creating stuff. Students in Spain uh, who are you know, doing part of it and then students in Germany doing another part and co-creating those mobile phones, those mobile films. So I think we've pretty much run out of time. Thank you.